morning. Well, it's a good day. It's a good day. Let's start with a word of prayer. I'm going to get right into it today. So let's uh, let us pray today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us to this place in this in this time together. Thank you for uh, giving us a day off tomorrow, Lord, as a as a uh, country, Lord, that we can be thankful for the sacrifices that have been made on our behalf. Lord, there's so many people who have laid down their lives for their friends and for the people they don't even know. This is such an incredible testament to love. Thank you for that. Lord, today help us to remember. And as we uh, go through your word, Lord, help us to have ears that are ready to hear, hearts that are ready to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I'm beginning a new series on the most, one of the most important announcements Jesus ever made. It's found in Matthew chapter 4. That's where we're going to be. So you can go and turn there, and uh, we're going to get to there uh, in just a moment. Um, we did a little short three-part series on the temptations of Jesus. And what happened is Jesus spent 40 days in a very grueling desert, overcoming temptations to show us that it could be done but not through anything that he did on his own you know he proved what Paul told us he said or um, he proved what it says in, 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 in scripture that no temptation has overtaken us except what is common to mankind he showed us that God is faithful and will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear and he showed us that God provides a way out of temptation for those of us who are willing to endure it and what we see is that Jesus sacrificed himself in that desert. He sacrificed his wants, his desires, the things that he really wanted to do. And he emerged focused. He emerged with laser focus on his mission and his ministry, which was to save the world. So let's read what it says immediately after Jesus comes out of the desert. This is Matthew chapter 4, and uh, we'll start in verse 12. Uh, it says this, When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum. Capernaum actually means the place of comfort. Little thing that is kind of interesting, I believe especially after coming out of the desert. Uh, Capernaum, which was the, by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is actually what John the Baptist preached too. And Jesus basically continues that exact same message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now I've been wondering what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Have you wondered that? And I will tell you with all openness and honesty, this week... I've struggled with that. When the terrible tragedy occurs around us, it's difficult. When the terrible tragedy occurred in Uvalde, I, I wondered, where is the kingdom of heaven? Sometimes it feels quite opposite of what Jesus is saying, that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Sometimes it does not feel near at all. I'm just being honest. This particular tragedy kind of hit home for, you know, Shelly and I and my family. And, you know, she's been teaching fourth grade for a very long time. So whenever we see, I'm sorry, I'm going to get my clicker. Whenever we see pictures of the victims, we don't just see students. I see her class. I see your students this year. I see your students of last year, the year before. When I look at those sweet teachers, I see her team this year, last year, the year before. And I'll tell you, sometimes I wonder, when will his kingdom come? 
When will his will be done on earth as it is in heaven? But then, in the middle of all this, one of our leaders contacts me and says, Hey, I'm, gonna, I'm contacting a church down there. And they contacted the Getty Street Church of Christ in Uvalde to see if there's anything that they needed from us. And as this leader of ours told me what he was going to do, I heard this deep desire in his voice to do something. He just couldn't, you know, just sit. So I was immediately encouraged. You know, this, this church is less than a mile away from Rob Elementary, and apparently, from my understanding, what I've heard, they've done a lot with that school. Kind of like we have a school that we uh, adopt and we have taken care of. They, uh, I believe, takes care of that, they, they take care of that school. They're teachers. I hope to be making an announcement at some point about, as far as how we can help, but it was so encouraging to hear from our leaders that, that, that they wanted to reach out while so many around us are just simply sending thoughts and prayers. I mean, thoughts and prayers are important. And you've heard me say this, and I will continue to say it. Prayer should always be our very first response to anything, good or bad. Prayer should be our first response always. But I don't think it should always just be our only response. Now, I know many of us have our ideas about why this particular thing happened. Or we have our opinions on what solution needs to be done to make things better. I've seen a lot of heated and angry debates on social media. There is such a thing as righteous anger. I believe that. When evil preys on the innocent, that makes me angry. Whenever evil preys on teachers who are sacrificing so much already. That makes me angry. You know, teachers are already, already being asked to do so much. You know, probably even more than they're even getting paid to do. Many of them, they work 12 to 16 hour days just to keep up with the already continuing demands that the state and the government put on them. And it's still going, y'all. They keep having things put on them. And they're sacrificing time with their families just to get some things done. So, so think about that the next time. They may not necessarily, you know, single out your child for doing something good. They've got a lot of things going on, and to top it all off now, now they have to sacrifice their life as well. Anger isn't always inappropriate. But what I have seen is that the public conversations on social media, they, the, the, these feeds that are all over, um, how much effort do people put into these things? And I think some of us may think that just because we've had this heated debate in a public forum that we've actually done something. You haven't. Just because you have an, an argument or a conversation doesn't mean you've actually done anything. There are more productive ways to have the conversations. But what I would do is I would encourage you to ask yourself in the middle of these, because I know we all have an opinion, and I think that that's, that's good. Ask yourself in the middle of this, what can we do to make this situation better? I know the conversations need to be had, and I think anger is appropriate. And what happened this past week, it should make you angry. But as it says in Psalms 4, as it says in Ephesians chapter 4, in your anger, do not sin. Which means you can be angry and not sin. You can even ask yourself, okay, how can I glorify God in the middle of my anger? How can I still serve Him? How can I give Here's a question, what more can I sacrifice to make things better? And I think this answer to this question can be found in today's lesson. The kingdom of heaven. You know, when Jesus came onto the scene, he did so whenever death was much more common. We're kind of in a utopia here. I don't know if you realize that, but for the longest time in the world, death was very common. And to to think that we can actually extend our lives by decades because of science 
is a gift from God, I believe. Jesus entered into a world where things were not easy at all. Death was much more common. People had little hope for, for a healthy life. They had little hope for, for really a future that they could design for themselves. They had very little hope for, you know, things that would help them live a fulfilling, satisfying life. Jesus begins his ministry by telling them that they could actually have an encounter with God because the kingdom of heaven was near. But he didn't just speak these hopeful words and move along. If you look at the Gospels, if you're a student of Scripture, you'll see in the New Testament, when Jesus says these things, he follows them up with action. Always. Sacrificially, he never demands anything for himself, only glory and attention for God. And from that moment on, what we start to see through the things that Jesus does, what we start to see is a world at one time so confident in his power start to crumble. We start to see it falter. So confident at one point in his power and control, it starts to break. Cracks start to form. We start seeing demons cast out of innocent victims. We start seeing sicknesses healed. And back then, they know, you know, sickness and spiritual sickness was tied together. If you were sick, then you were spiritually sick. Oftentimes, a bad diagnosis excluded you from the family of God. So he's healing sicknesses and restoring peoples to their faith community. We even see the dead start to be raised through the power of Jesus. The evil one stripped of his ultimate power over sin and death. Wow. Hope was emerging because the power of God was being shown through a human someone who is fully human. And what does it look like? Well, it was pure love, and pure love is always sacrificial. Always. And what did Jesus' power look like? It looked like this. It looked like sacrificial love. It looked like faith expressed through sacrifice each and every day. And if you know, want to know what the superpower of the follower of Jesus is, it's this. It's sacrifice. It's, it's faith expressed through sacrificial love. So in, in light of this, what we're talking about, what, is, what does faith look like uh, here and now, especially in the horrors that we've seen this week? You know, for some of us, it may simply be, you know, spending time at one of our many schools in town. may simply just be saying I'm available it may mean you begin to substitute teach it may even begin that you just tell you know the PTA I'm here <laughs> even if you don't have any kids going to school it may mean you go to the principal and say hey I'm available for you maybe it's a few hours a month maybe it's a day a month maybe it's more maybe you work with us here at Johnson Street as we bless our partner school In a small way, maybe we could start by sacrificially not firing off a condescending response to someone else's opinion. Just because someone posts something or says something doesn't mean we need to respond to that something. How about we show our faith by sacrificing our desire to set someone straight? Instead, we could turn, turn it into helping someone, sacrificing for someone. If we know that there is a need for help, but all we're doing is arguing or sitting at home doing nothing but sending thoughts and prayers, then it, is it really faith that we possess? What does James tell us in James chapter 2? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself 
if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And I'll, but I'll say it again, our first response should always be prayer, fervent prayer. And with that being said, I, I'm concerned that the phrase thoughts and prayers gives us the feeling that we're doing something without us actually having to sacrifice much of anything. And I know some of us, that's all we can do is pray. It's all we can do. And I, that's great. If this is all you can do, if you're giving, then, then great. But the rest of us, how much are we willing to sacrifice? If we aren't sacrificing our wants and our desires for others, then it doesn't matter what we do here on Sunday morning from 10 to 11, 20, whenever I get done sometimes doesn't matter what we do here on Sunday morning if we're not sacrificing for others. In fact, Paul tells us very clearly what true and proper worship is. He says it's presenting your body as a living sacrifice. That is true and proper worship. Tell me wherever else it says in Scripture exactly what true worship is. That's, he says it right there. So if, if, if all we're doing is coming in here on Sunday morning and we're only concerned about what's uncomfortable for us, are you really sacrificing anything for your brother? If the song is being sung that we don't like, well, maybe it's not for you. Maybe it's for your brother or your sister. I love it. We get to sacrifice for one another here. But if we're not sacrificing our wants and desires out in our everyday life, then what, what, good, is, what good are we doing here? And I'm asking myself the same question because there are some things I don't like either. And the only person who knows about it is my wife. But am I really here for me? Present our bodies as living sacrifices. And I say all this because I know how important it is to put action behind our belief, behind our faith. This is why the Christianity grew so much in the early days. It is because people were following the Spirit by standing in for God. And what I mean by that is that they were focused on showing people what the, what the love of God looked like. They're putting their lives aside, their futures aside, their wealth aside for the sake of others is what they were doing. They were literally laying down their lives, laying down their desires, laying down their rights. They had died with Christ. They said, I'm, I'm dead with Christ. I no longer live. It's now Christ who lives in me. And so what they, what they wanted, their physical desires, it didn't matter anymore. At that point, there was neither Jew nor Greek. There was neither slave nor free, male nor female. They were all in one. They're all one in Christ Jesus. We find that in Galatians 3. Their pedigree didn't matter. Their social status didn't matter. Their, their citizenship didn't matter. Their gender didn't matter. Their opinions didn't matter because their lives were filled with doing the work of God by loving so deeply that their lives were literally living sacrifices for their friends, for their community, and for their God. I mean, this approach to faith is literally what it means to embody the kingdom of heaven. If you encounter someone like that, how is that not attractive? When you encounter someone, how does that not rock your world? I grew up thinking the kingdom of heaven was really something that I would see one day when we died. That it was reserved for the dead in Christ, but Jesus does not say this. If we live as if the kingdom is far away, then we won't be fully present in the here and now. And we'll never be fully invested. Because the kingdom of heaven, hear this, I should have made a slide on this. The kingdom of heaven is neither a time nor a place but rather it is a condition where, where the kingship of God is acknowledged, where the promises of God, his promises to, to restore the world and free us from the power of sin and death, those promises are beginning to be fulfilled. And I know some of you are saying it's been 2,000 years since this announcement. Could we not have more? I get it. But hey, we're living decades longer. And I don't think that's just because science. I think there are lots of faithful people who've been focused on sacrificing their life for the sake of others. I love it, you know, we, we did IVF with our, you know, youngest, and 
I was so thankful for that doctor who spent his life researching, helping infertile couples have children. Wow. We see this this in the life of Jesus, this, this idea of the kingdom of heaven. You know, he didn't just tell people that the kingdom of heaven was near and then go about his day thinking only of himself. No, he expressed his faith and love through sacrifice each and every day for the sake of others so that he could bring glory to God and bring light to those who lived in the darkness. That's what we see in Matthew 4. We talk, it talks about light entering into the world because this was a very dark world filled with people who desperately needed forgiveness. The kingdom of God was breaking in. Light was finding its way through those cracks as the world starts to fracture. The power that the dark one had over the world is starting to crumble and light starts to break in. The kingdom of heaven is such a huge theme throughout scripture. And for the next several weeks, we're gonna be hearing how it's described in several stories. Uh, We see glimpses of it. And we also see the necessity through these stories and see the necessity of action. We see the necessity of sacrifice and faith and love. And the kingdom of heaven is not a new kingdom. It's a very old kingdom. The closest I, I think we came to really experiencing it fully was, was probably back in the garden. What does it say in the very beginning? Uh, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the water. Same spirit we are able to have access to right now. And, and God said, let there be light and there was light. And the light that was brought into the world was able to help this garden, help it to nurture this garden that God had created man, uh, for mankind, right? He created the garden for mankind to inhabit to work, to care for. The garden was a place where humanity was able to experience the kingdom of heaven on a very personal level. So if we go back to the garden, we get a glimpse of what the kingdom of heaven is all about. And I think if we, I'm gonna just go through four, four points and we're almost done. Listen to these points and just see what Jesus has done to bring us closer to the kingdom of heaven if we go back to the garden we get a glimpse of what the kingdom of heaven is all about first of all there was a personal relationship with God he liked to walk through the garden in the cool of the day with his creation I mean think about it after creation the first thing he did is he says I want to rest not take a nap not sleep he wanted to walk with his people he wanted to enjoy his creation because it was good I mean, can you imagine God eager to go walk with his people? He was eager with love and joy. There was also purpose. We knew our purpose was to take care of the world he had given it, not just to work it for food, but to enjoy its beauty, to enjoy its mysteries, to live in amazement at how God could do all of this. Because he did this for all of us. So our responsibility was very clear and it was assigned by God for our well-being. There was also companionship. Humanity was not alone. We had God, we had one another. Male, female, man, and woman, they were together. She was a helper to him, but she wasn't subservient because the same word that's used for helper is the same word that's used to describe how God helped us several times in the Old Testament. She was a help to him. There was friendship. There was sacrificial love and true connection with one another. There was also no guilt or shame. Man, what what must that have been like, huh? No guilt or shame. They were naked and were not ashamed. Now, I don't see this as simply a clothing issue. I see it as a vulnerability issue. They were open and honest not hiding anything from one another. They had nothing to hide. So when sin enters the world, all of these things changed. And Genesis 3 shows us just what that curse started to look like. We start seeing separation. Our purpose turned from enjoyment 
to survival. Our companionship turned from mutuality to hierarchy, from sacrifice to power and control. Oh, and the guilt and shame that flooded the world. The first thing God did, he had to slay animals to clothe his children. God had to kill When Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is near, this is what he's saying. He's telling you it's time because God is setting things right now. He's turning our Genesis 3 world back into a Genesis 2 world. He's telling you that he wants a relationship with you. He's telling you that there's purpose for you, very clear purpose, that he wants to fulfill you. He's telling you you are not alone. He's telling you you don't have to be paralyzed by guilt or shame any longer. No more. He's showing us a way to the kingdom that takes us back through the garden where curses have no more power, where people and partnerships are redeemed, relationships are set right again. It has begun. And how do we see it? We have to repent. Repent from our selfish, self-centered life. We have to turn away from our inaction. We have to turn away from our sin and our lack of self-control. We have a self-control problem in our country. To repent is to sacrifice your life for something far better, something far more significant, far more eternal. And when you repent and believe in God and Jesus, then you will begin to see it shine far more brightly than you've ever seen it before. God will start revealing it to you. I mean, think about it. Even the smallest glimmer of light will overcome the darkness. The light shines more brightly through sacrifice. So my encouragement to you today is to repent. Repent to believe to live for the sake of others to bring glory to God allow the light of your life to shine through prayer through action through sacrifice and I think if you do this you won't just be it won't just be you seeing the kingdom of heaven at work it will be others in your world that will see the kingdom of heaven shine brightly I've seen so many people in this church shine. I've seen the kingdom of heaven in the midst of all this. Even in the midst of my discouragement this week, I see it shine. So thank you for that. I love this church because you have shined so brightly in this city. And I tell you, this city needs light. And we're just one city, a small one at that. So shine. Shine through sacrifice. Shine through love. Let's all stand together. Uh, we've got men and women around the room that would love to pray with you. And I know right now you may not know what to do, but let us pray for you at least. Come find one of us. We would love to just pray on your behalf. And, and if you need more, let us know. We would like to do more. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for today. There are some times when, when I don't have the words. And you know our frustrations and you know where we are and, and I know you forgive us whenever we get ahead of you, whenever we begin to doubt. And Lord, I know that you've got a bigger um, plan at place. Help us to trust you. And while we wait to see more of the kingdom of heaven shine, while we wait, Lord, help us to do so with complete trust and dependence on you. Through prayer, Lord, I pray that our actions shine brightly as well. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets.